So when we talk, look at forensic log analysis and when we talk about log analysis, it really can include other things than just web logs, but for the time being, we'll just talk about web logs. Um, we're, uh, uh, much of the summer, much of the summarization type stuff that, that I've talked about before remains the same. There's only a couple of things that are different, and we'll talk about that now. Um, okay. Oh, the battery's dying. Okay. Uh, so, log analysis. So what's different? Um, well, the first thing is is that when you're looking at a web log, you really don't have to immediately, first thing, put that into a database. You can just treat it as a text file. So. It, you, it's one of those things where you can, if you want to, put it into a database uh, file, and I'll, and, and I'll, I'll show you how to do that if you want for a particular database format. We can for a particular web log format that we came across, but you don't have to. The advantages of doing of putting it into a d database is that you can isolate records more more immediately. Uh, so if you're interested in a particular date range, that's Easier done in database format. If you're only, if you're only, if you don't care about date ranges or other things that might be hard to locate, you may not want to put it into a database just because it's already in the text file and it's generally small enough. Um, so, one of the things you can do is if you want to see all the IP address information for a particular IP, in this case, 130. 215.10.1 is my is, is where I went to college. So if you wanted to look for all the traffic uh, from that particular IP address, you grep uh, that IP address for all the files in a given directory. So star, it will search the entire directory tree for that particular IP address. So that would be one way of doing that. Now the only thing they would have to be careful of when you're using grep is to make sure that if your server IP address is 130.215.10.1, you may want to, at that point, make, put it into a database so you can, instead of searching for all the activity on that web server, just that activity which where that IP address is a, is a client instead of a server. Um, so, if you have basic authentication, you may be able to search for the user's name as well. So you can do that. Search, use grep to search for everything and looking like Zaz, with a star, with a star to search for all the files. And that would work. Um, so if you want to, uh, SQLite is a powerful light embedded database system. Basically, you, you don't have any software which you have to install. You can just type SQLite.exe uh, and a file name, and you, and you at, at that point you've created a database file. You can then create tables. You can insert rows. You can delete rows. All the function that that SQL uh, provides, you can use that. Um, the powerful thing about it is that it's very low overhead. Uh, it's actually embedded uh, in many operating systems because the operate because the license for SQLite is uh, it's basically is um, you can use it for any purpose. Period. Basically, it's a very open, forgiving license. Uh, so, all public domain. That's what I was. Looking the, the, sort of the SQLite is public domain, so anyone can use that for anything. Um, you can store up to, you start hitting a performance wall once you, once you start getting up to 800 gigs of data. Most people aren't going to import 800 gigs of data, but for reasonably large amounts of data, it's, it's reasonably good to a certain point. Um, it technically supports up to, I believe it was, 200 terabytes of data. It's a large number. But again, for free, 
you, so you'll probably end up running into operating system limitations before you run into SQLite limitations. The only gotchas with SQLite is that it's really, in order to do a transaction, you lock the entire database file. So that means no one else can do trans transactions while you have that database locked. Uh, while you have that file locked, so that's just one thing to be aware of. It's really designed for read many cases as compared to read and read and write cases. But um, if you go to sqlite.org, it has a whole bunch more information about it, which is awesome. So for all that said, you can then create a table called blog, which has a date, URL, remote host, and whatever other files or whatever other <coughs> structure of the, of the uh, uh, structure for your particular log file that you care about. And then create an index on the file, on the column that you think you'll be using. And you're good. So in this case, the, the particular format here of the dates virtual host URL, the notes are response length, some unknown field, and an HTTP response code is a format of the freeshell.org uh, web server log. So using that table structure, we can import using uh, specifying a separator of a bar and then importing, we can then uh, use SQLite to import log.txt into the table log and it would just work. At that point, you can do things like select a stink remote host from the log or any other SQL query that you want and it will be incredibly fast. So that's it's a really cool thing. Um, so that's a sample where I've actually done that. Uh, so And you can do select the same remote host. You can do select the distinct of anything that you really need. So it's pretty cool. As you can tell, it's sort of testing. Uh, this is just a, a group of, uh, of lines uh, that involve zach.freeshell.org. And you can get a list of all the distinct hosts of clients. And it, it just works. It's, it, yes, it just runs so cool. Um, it, it, uh, it's a it's a system wide test, basically. Um, the entire code base, I believe, is I know the executable is about 800k. So the actual uh, files, the actual source code, I believe, is much shorter. And in, like in this case, we're using SQLite as the executable. Like there, if you install the Perl module for SQLite, you get the entire SQLite engine in addition to the module to actually access the database as compared to other um, other things where you would first have to install the Oracle server, then install the Oracle client, and magically, hopefully, get the Perl module to work. That's sort of the glue between the Perl and the actual Oracle client itself which may or may not work depending on your day, the correct incarnation to make work with it. There's, it's a little bit of a joke. I'll talk about real-time analysis, analysis here briefly. There are entire courses, specifically open security training that InfoSight Master Network Forensics that deal with this topic explicitly. I'm just sort of saying, hey, this is a brief intro to it to sort of cover it in the grand scope of dealing with web forensics as a topic. Um, basically, you're running software either on the network itself or uh, on a computer like your own to see what activity is happening from which, 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 is, which, oh, which like other my, users my, are, are we, running We right do now. here. Yes. Yeah, OK. Yeah. So it's it's one of those things that uh, that yes, it's perfectly fine for you to do it. It's just really sensitive information as right. long as you're dealing as long as you're handling it appropriately. 
Um, a couple of graphical, the TCP dump is a really basic uh, tool that will just give you the network packets that are going across the network. Wireshark Wire will actually try to interpret more of the output into with meaningful protocols to display it in a user-friendly fashion. So it would actually identify, hey, you're using a POP protocol to check your email, here's your username, here's your password, this is your host, all that other type of stuff specific to the <coughs> protocol for POP. So that's the type of stuff that it, that Wireshark gives you. It's a graphical way of looking at the captured data. Capture data. You can also capture data directly with the application itself. Um, TCP dump is just a text tool that will capture all of the traffic on a particular port without the interpretation of what's being sent across the network. So that um, allows you to. Uh, it, that but basically because it's not GUI, it takes up less memory and can generally get more <coughs> captured packets correctly. Is there a little bit of magic here, but that's the reason why I'm just briefly touching this. Um, it, it becomes hard really fast because um, when you start looking at real-time incoming and outgoing packets, there's a ton of network activity which is just in the background of what you're doing in addition to what you might actually care about looking at. So that's something you definitely need to be aware of. Um, to search for a random packet, you really need to uh, be organized, know how to use databases, know how to use grep to look for appropriate packets. Um, because they might be very hard to find if you're dealing with a lot of data. This is a sample screen dump of Netcat, which is incredibly tiny. It's not easy to read, but basically this is from a host on Meyer.org going to the Amazon EC2 instance and we're just getting acknowledgement packets back and forth while something's happening in the background. Um, there are tools that do real-time analysis and I'm not the person to ask for this type of information. The InfoSec list has uh, recommendations and there's a post that has that type of information. Some of the tools that do this at various price points, which I'm not really sure of because I, I'm just aware that these technologies exist more than anything else is that with Net, that, Net Witness and Solera. Uh, and that's basically that. Um, I will completely redirect all questions to the InfoSec list rather than to ask me because I that's basically just a high level, yes, it does exist type question that I'm answering at this point. Uh, and InfoCyclist will definitely have better answers. And also, if you take the time to go through the Open Security Training.info course, which is um, Open Security Training.info, is where a bunch of MITRE Institute courses that are publicly released, uh, their videos end up going online. So. With that, you can start doing, you can have a good foundation in uh, networking and forensic analysis of so doing it that way as well. Um, caveats, internet security, security is a huge field that's growing constantly, blah, blah, blah. There will always be new attacks and defenses. Everything here is old. Uh, there will always be security conferences, so because of all these things, there's going to be new ways to exploit the browsers. There's going to be new uh, proxies like Tor that will be better ways to hide where you're going and all that stuff. But all these caveats will still generally exist. Um, so do we have questions? <coughs> 